This video is part of the series to accompany discrete mathematics and functional programming. I'm Thomas Vandernen. In this video, we introduce three important properties that some relations have. As usual, when we introduce new definitions, the real goal is to practice writing proofs that use these definitions. Proofs of propositions about these properties will dominate our discussion in this video. As with other videos that demonstrate proofs, I'll be moving through things faster than I would if I were talking to students in person. I encourage you to stop the video and back it up from time to time to make sure you catch it all. In the previous sections, we talked about relations from a set A to a set B, but noted also that a relation can be from a set A to itself, in which case we would refer to it as a relation on a set A. It is important to note that the properties we're talking about today make sense only for relations on a single set, not from one set to another. First property is reflexivity. A reflexive relation is one in which every element in the set is related to itself. Formally, for all little x in set big X, x is related to itself in relation R. The diagraph to the left shows an example relation that happens to be reflexive. You can always tell a reflexive relation from its digraph by noticing that every relation has a self-loop, indicating it is related to itself. Reflexive relations include equals, equivalence of propositional forms, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, subset, is acquainted with on people, assuming every person is acquainted with himself. A relation is symmetric if all pairs in the relation are mutual. That is, for any pair, the inverse of that pair also exists. Formally, if x and y are elements of the set big X, and also assuming that x is related to y in relation R, then y must be also related to x in relation R. In the digraph of a symmetric relation, like the one shown, you can see that every arrow has a similar arrow going the other way, all except for the self-loops, which are their own inverse. Is opposite of on integers, is on same river as on cities, and is acquainted with on people are all symmetric. A transitive relation has a property that any place you can get to in two hops, you can get to in one hop. Formally, if we have x, y, and z as elements of some set big X, and if x is related to y and y is related to z in some relation R, then x must be related to z in that relation. Notice that although this is stated to refer to two pairs, by implication it extends to a larger chain of pairs. For example, if in a transitive relation A is related to B, B is related to C, and C is related to D, then A must be related to D. Here's why. Transitivity immediately says that A must be related to C in that case. Since C is related to D, then applying transitivity again means that A is related to D. In the digraph, trace with your eyes any route from one vertex to another by any number of intermediate vertices. There will also be a direct link from the starting point to the ending point. That's transitivity. Here they are in summary. If this is the first time you've seen any of these, you should pause the video and take some time to gain intuition about them. Think of example relations that have one or more of these properties. Draw digraphs of relations that have one or more of them. Okay, if you think you're ready to attack the proofs, then first notice the similarities in these definitions. All of them are universally quantified, for one. Also, all conclude by asserting that some tuple exists in the relation. Thus, if you know that a relation is, for example, transitive, then you can use that fact to show that some two things are related to each other. Likewise, to prove that a relation has one of these properties, you would need to show that any such tuple, as appears in the conclusion, exists in the relation. Notice also the differences. Reflexivity requires picking one element from the set that the relation is on. 
Symmetry is pick two. Transitivity is pick three. Transitivity contains a conditional with two propositions in its hypothesis, namely x is related to y and y is related to z. Symmetry contains a conditional with a simple hypothesis, only x is related to y. Reflexivity does not contain a conditional. This will make crucial difference as we observe proofs. Here are the structure of the proofs for these definitions. These might make more sense for you after we have seen some specific examples and after you've tried some on your own, but you also should be starting to be able to analyze proof structure in the abstract. Reflexivity is the simplest, so observe that to answer the universal quantification in the definition, we begin by picking an arbitrary element, say little x, from big X, the set that the relation R is on. Somehow, we need to show that the element x is related to itself in relation R, and that would prove that all the elements are related to themselves, and so R is reflexive. For symmetry, we would need to pick two elements. Moreover, we would need to assume that one of the two we picked is related to the other. The definition of symmetry then requires that we show that the second is related to the first. Transitivity requires that we pick three elements and moreover that the first is related to the second, the second to the third. The work is to show that in such an arbitrary case the first that we picked is related to the third. As you see here in the pattern we would, we would need to show that x is related to z. For convenience, it is often acceptable to shorten the proof structure of symmetry and transitivity by combining the suppositions. Here, if we suppose x is related to y in R in a proof of symmetry, that implies that x and y are elements from the set x, similarly for transitivity. Note that there is no short form for reflexivity it is important to note we must start by supposing we have an element in the set. After all, what we're trying to show in reflexivity is that any element in the set is related to itself. Now let's try our hand at using these definitions to prove that specific relations have these properties. Let's prove that the relation divides is reflexive if it is defined on natural numbers. This appears as theorem 5.5 in the book. Start by picking a natural number. We want to show that that arbitrarily chosen element is related to itself. That is, we must show that it divides itself. We must find a natural number which, multiplied by a, makes a. Obviously, we're looking for 1. That allows us to assert that a divides itself. That completes the definition of reflexivity. We have proven that divides is reflexive. Now, prove that the relation is opposite of is symmetric on the set of integers. The relation is that relation such that a is related to b if a and b are opposites. To be opposite means that they sum to zero. For example, 5 and negative 5. Pick two arbitrary integers. Suppose that x is the opposite of y, that is, they sum to zero. Commutativity helps us here. It seemed obvious at the beginning that y plus x is zero. We're just giving a name for it here. But this is enough to conclude that is opposite of is symmetric. If this seems pedantic, I don't mean to insult your intelligence. The point of an example like this is to clarify the structure of a proof of symmetry. For transitivity, consider again the relation divides but this time on all the integers, not just the natural numbers. This is theorem 5.7 in the book. Exercise 5.4.1 asks you to think about why we considered only natural numbers for reflexivity, and exercise 5.4.2 asks you why divides is not symmetric. Pick three integers, a, b, and c. Also, suppose one is related to the second, which in turn is related to the third. Well, when we say is related to in this case, we mean divides. I guess if you wanted to be more concise, you could say that by supposing A divides B and B divides C, 
it implies that they're all integers. This is a use of the short version. Now, invoke the definition of divides analytically. There must exist d and e such that a times d equals b and b times e equals c. Substitute a times d in for b in the second equation to get a times d times e equals c. Associativity allows us to rearrange the parentheses as shown. d times e is the factor we're looking for. Invoke the definition of divides again, this time synthetically, to assert that a divides c. The definition of transitivity is satisfied. If arbitrary elements a, b, and c are related, as opposed, we have shown that a must be related to c. That's what transitivity means. The previous three examples were about specific concrete relations. Now let's see the definitions used in more complicated propositions, this time about abstract sets and relations. Assume here that A is any set and R is any relation on A. We claim here that if R is reflexive, then the identity relation on the set A is a subset of the relation R. I thank a former student for suggesting this problem. See exercise 5.3.9 for an explanation of the identity relation. Okay, the proposition is a conditional, so we suppose the hypothesis. This reduces us to proving that the identity relation on A is a subset of R. Well, this is our old friend the subset proof. We know how to do that. Pick something on the left and show it's on the right. Since the set on the left is a relation, what we pick out of it must be a tuple. Let's call it AB. The identity relation is simply that relation where everything is related to itself. If A is related to B in the identity relation, then A must be the same thing as B. But everything is related to itself in a reflexive relation, so A must be related to B in the relation R. This is true because our supposition is that R is reflexive. That's enough to show subset. Assume again that A is an arbitrary set and R is an arbitrary relation on that set. No matter what R is, if you take its inverse and intersect the two together, the result is symmetric. At least, so we claim. This is theorem 5.6 in the book. First make sure you accept the idea that relations are sets and so we can compute their intersection. Second, make sure you accept the idea that the intersection of two relations on the same set is itself a relation. Suppose the hypothesis. We want to show that R intersect R inverse is a symmetric relation. So pick two elements from A. Specifically, Suppose that those two elements are in R intersect R inverse. This is very important. Notice we did not assume anything about A and B being related in R itself or R inverse itself. It is R intersect R inverse that we're trying to show is symmetric. So we need to suppose that A is related to B in that relation. If at this point you said something like, suppose A is related to B in R, you would be getting off on the wrong foot. That is a very common mistake for beginners to make in my experience. Now that we have that right, we can shorten it up a bit. Now we want to show that B is related to A in the relation R intersect R inverse. Analyze the use of intersection. Now we are indeed saying that AB is in R and AB is in R inverse. We showed that though. We didn't suppose it. Now apply the definition of inverse. BA must be in R inverse and BA must be in R. Now we own this proof. Use the definition of intersection synthetically to construct the fact that BA is in R intersect R inverse. BA being in R intersect R inverse gives us symmetry. One more example. The statement of this one is more complicated. 
Again, assume that R is an arbitrary relation on an arbitrary set A. This time, we're saying that if for any element little a in set big A, the image of its image is a subset of the image, that's enough to show that R is transitive. Take a moment to consider what that means. It's also important that you recognize that the subset assertion is actually part of the hypothesis, not part of the conclusion. The image of little a is everything that a is related to. The image of the image is everything that anything a is related to is in turn related to. If an element x is in the image of the image, that means that there is some y in the image related to x. And for y to be in the image, that means a is related to y. This is similar to almost the converse of exercise 5.4.27. OK, let's prove it. Suppose the hypothesis. I'm using b, c, and d so as not to conflict with little a used in the statement of the proposition. There are different kinds of variables, though. A ranges over the entire set. We're assuming something is true for any A. B, C, and D are arbitrary but specific elements that we have picked. We can apply what we said was true for a any A to them. C must be in the image of B, since B is related to C. Likewise, since C is related to D, and C is in the image of B, D must be in the image of the image of B. This is basically saying that there is something in the image of B, namely C, that is related to D. Now we can use the fact we assumed. We assumed it was true for any element little a in set big A. B is such an element, so we can apply it to D and B here. For D to be in the image of B means that B is related to D. That's exactly what we need to prove that R is transitive. To review, make sure you understand how these proof patterns work to prove that some relation has one of these properties. One way to test yourself is to explain why there is no short form for reflexivity. You should note that since symmetry and transitivity have conditionals, they can be vacuously true. That is, the empty relation with no pairs is both symmetric and transitive. Reflexivity can't be vacuously true. That is, unless the set itself is empty. Understanding the proofs will take time and practice. So apply yourself to the exercises in section 5.4. The next few sections build on these properties. Section 5.5 considers special facts about relations that have all three properties. Sections 5.6 and 5.7 look more deeply at transitivity. Sections 5.8 and 5.9 consider relations that are reflexive and transitive and have yet another property different from, but related to, symmetry.